Our goal is to educate and empower the community to reduce the burden of diabetes. I am Glorice Xenos Taylor. I'm a diabetes educator and dietitian for community outreach. And I'm very pleased to introduce today this program called Wellness Head to Toe for Diabetes Control. Uh, you're here today, which tells me a lot that you're doing your part to stay informed and engage in your, in your health care. And I'm very grateful for myself and everybody at St. Luke's that you're choosing us as a trusted source for information. At St. Luke's, we take pride uh, saying our specialty is you. And we stand by our mission and our vision as a non-for-profit, faith-based community hospital by engaging with local and with national efforts to increase access to health and wellness resources to all people. Too often, we focus on disease management instead of health promotion. And this is why I was inspired on tonight's theme for wellness and how to embrace it so that we can all live healthier lives. I'm gonna proceed by introducing today's panel. Our moderator is Dr. Sam Flanders. He is our newest addition, I wanna to say, to our team. He joined St. Luke's in 2021 as an Executive Vice President for Quality, Patient Safety, and Population Health. Prior to coming to St. Luke's, he held a similar position at Beaumont Health, uh, uh, an eight hospital health system in Southwest Michigan from really big to much smaller, huh, doctor? Very good. For over 30 years, he has served as a volunteer physician at summer camps for children with diabetes, helping to educate and support young campers to better control their diabetes. Because for 30 years, he was a general pediatrician. Our next panelist is Dr. Pooja Natasan, or Dr. Nate. She's a board certified physician in family medicine at Baldwin Family Medicine. She completed her family medicine residency at Cleveland Clinic at Akron General in Akron, Ohio. Dr. Nate provides comprehensive primary care and sees patients from infants to grandparents. She seeks to make a difference in her patients' lives and feels that an effective patient-physician relationship is one that is built on partnership. She believes in taking care of the whole family and applies that family-based approach to her practice. Dr. Nate listens to her patients and gets their input regarding their treatment options. Through education, advice, and support, she strives to provide the highest quality health care. And one of my favorite things about Dr. Nate is that she offers her services not only in English, but also in Spanish. Uh, Dr. Mireli El Hayek, is a board certified in endocrinology at Endocrine Associates. Dr. El Hayek completed her fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism at St. Louis University School of Medicine. Dr. El Hayek is committed to helping her patients achieve a high quality of life while managing their chronic conditions and often ongoing medical issues. She works individually with patients to balance the medications needed to treat their conditions with lifestyle and preventive measures. She believes in multidisciplinary approach to healthcare and works closely with her patients and their healthcare team. Next, we have Emily Hafner. She is a registered dietitian, my colleague, and diabetes uh, care and education specialist. She holds a master's degree in medical dietetics from St. Louis University. She first started her career working uh, in an OBGYN practice where she focused a lot on weight management, women's health, and gestational diabetes. And this is where she first developed her passion for working with patients with diabetes. She joined the St. Luke's uh, team for the Nutrition, Wellness, and Diabetes Center, and she's providing outpatient nutrition education and counseling, counseling for a variety of conditions. Last but not least, we have Ryan Medes, who is our clinical pharmacist specialist, and he splits his time between working on the hospital floors, addressing internal medicine conditions, and opioid stewardship, pain management, and the anticoagulation clinic. He received his pharmacy degree from Butler University in Indianapolis. 
Ryan has completed his residency for G1 uh, and G2, an internal medicine here at St. Luke's, before we recruited him, and he's part of our department. So we have a wonderful panel today. The theme is wellness, and I'm going to let it open up uh, by Dr. Flanders to get the conversation going. And the idea to make this a rich engagement is for you to have an opportunity to address questions directly to the panel. So we're going to have them introduce themselves and talk a bit about some wellness and diabetes. And next, we're going to proceed for a live Q&A. For those of you who are virtual, please use the chat, um, the chat box for those questions. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Clarice. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, such an important topic, diabetes. And um, I guess I'm the senior member of the panel here uh, with the, the most gray hair. But um, and as Clarice said, I've been involved, my involvement with diabetes has been working with kids with type 1 diabetes at summer camps for a long time. And um, because I've been doing this for a number of years, I've seen an amazing evolution. So diabetes is a tough disease. You all know this. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, and the complications can be uh, very bad if it's not treated well. But the tools we have to treat it today are better than we've ever had before. When I first started um, at camp, it used to take two minutes to do a blood sugar and it involved um, a squirt bottle, it looked like a ketchup bottle squirting water on the strip, if you can imagine, and blotting and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, there was no such thing as an insulin pump. Uh, the insulins had a lot more side effects, caused a lot more low blood sugars, and there were very few to choose from. Um, and there was uh, n nothing out there to really prevent people from getting diabetes uh, when they had it early. Um, fast forward now to 2022, there are programs to help people who are in the early stages to, to prevent them from progressing to diabetes that have been proven to work. We have fantastic insulins with lower so side effects. We have continuous glucose monitors. Um, we have insulin pumps and all sorts of things that we didn't have before which it doesn't take the burden away, but it sure makes it a lot easier. So I think we're living in a good time when it's uh, a lot easier to deal with. Um, people older than me remember when the only way to check a blood sugar was to boil your urine and put a tablet in the test tube. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's come, it's come uh, probably more than most illnesses have in terms of, uh, of, of the ability to treat it successfully. And I'm sure a lot of questions will come up about some of the things that I just briefly touched on, but I'm going to start out just to kind of break the ice. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just briefly tell us, uh, why did you choose to go into health care? Emily, you want to go first? I'm going to remove my mask just to talk. Um, so I, I always enjoyed my um, science-based courses, of course, in, in earlier ages. Um, and then I went to uh, my undergraduate undergrad in Indiana and um, had my first, I was pre-med nursing. Um, and then I had my first foods course and I said, what am I doing? Um, I need to be where the food's at. Uh, which I think everyone can relate to. <laughs> um, so ever since the, my, my first foods course, um, I've been um, very interested in how uh, food always related to medicine. Um, and then that just further progressed um, when food directly relates um, with health so much as it is with diabetes, um, it was really, really beneficial for me to work with people, um, drawing that connection, and then helping them see results really instantaneously. So I just kept furthering my career path to, to solely focus on, on diabetes. So, but yeah. My name's Dr. Nate. Um, so I came into medicine uh, because my uh, dad had a heart attack when I was getting my master's in public health, and I didn't really understand anything. My mom told me I don't have time to teach you, read the nursing books, and figure it out. So <laughs> I did, and they were interesting, but I wanted more information. So um, she had made a comment, maybe you should look into med school, and so I looked into it, and I found it very fascinating. But what brought me to primary care was, when you're in primary care, it gives you that first line to, to educate the patient on what to do. And I feel a lot, looking back at my father's health history, he didn't understand his disease, but he didn't take it seriously. And um, we have seen that sometimes if you don't understand, you can't empower yourself. So my goal as a primary care doctor is to empower my patients so they know why their disease is hurting them and not just order people around. So that doesn't help. If we're a team, then we can work together. So. Great. Thank you very much. So my name is Dr. Hayek. Oh. Uh, there you go. Just flip it up. My name is Dr. Al Hayek. Um, as many of you said, so 
during school, during undergrad, I liked science, biology, and I wanted to go into a profession where I can actually make a difference and make a change in the lives of people. And I've grown around uh, people who have diabetes, my grandmother, my uncles, so I wanted to be able to help them and understand their disease and help them manage it. Um, mostly. And so I'm Ryan Midas, and so I went into healthcare in general uh, because I really just really wanted to help people. And so really what got me on the pharmacy track was actually in high school, I had the opportunity to shadow a couple of different pharmacists in different capacities. And I really liked how accessible they were as a profession and um, just how easy it was to be able to interact with patients um, from that pr perspective. Super. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Um, does anyone have anything that they want to say just to get things started before we turn it over to our guests to ask us questions? Doc, I forgot to say something. Sure. So, sorry, it's a housekeeping. Um, we have wonderful attendance prices. You guys completed uh, a little game on how to keep your health on track and uh, hopefully connected those, those, uh, those words to what it means with the goal. And if you did not turn in your track card, please wave it and we'll come pick it up. We will announce the winner right at the end of the Q&A, okay? Thank you. That was an important announcement. That was an important yep. announcement. <laughs> Very good. Does anybody have anything they want to say to get started, or should we just get going with questions? Questions? Okay, good. So um, we'll, we'll open it up for in just a second. Um, please ask your question as loudly as you can. Clarice is going to repeat it into the microphone because we have some people that are on Zoom with us tonight, too, so that they can hear the question as well. So who wants to get started? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and repeat the question. The participants asking if your blood sugars are very high, above 250, and it's been more than four or five hours since you've eaten, what's going on? I thought when you eat, your blood sugar goes up. When you don't eat, your blood sugar should go down. So, I mean, so it, it means that you're probably not getting the treatment that you need to. So you have to re-talk to your, to your doctor, to your endocrinologist, and readjust your medications. Um, it means that you're, if you're type two, that means that you need more medications to be added. Um, in general, so people have a tendency to think that if you're not eating, your blood sugars should go down. But some people, you know, will just wake up with high blood sugars because your body will continue to produce glucose or you're not, is not, in using the insulin right or it's not producing enough insulin. So that means that you need to talk to your doctor about readjusting your medications. So what if I have multiple medications to regulate my blood sugar and still my blood sugar is always high no matter what I eat? Dr. Nate? So with that, there's a lot of things that go together with that, but one of the things I find, at least in a primary care perspective, a lot of my patients will start keeping a food log of what they're eating daily, and they can sometimes start pinpointing, okay, if I eat these type of foods at night, I have higher spikes in the morning, but if I increase protein, for example, and decrease my carbohydrate or more complex carbs versus simpler carbs, then they do better with their blood sugars in the morning. But it's a really complex and there's not a simple answer, but I would say with starting with a food journal, just so you can kind of keep a trend of what you're doing. And then if your body's not responding to like three or four oral medicines, sometimes that's when we have the talk that maybe we need the endocrinologist's help. And if they can't afford to go, then we talk about maybe we need to go to insulin because your body's not responding to the insulin that you're making. Emily, did you want to add something? Um, she said food blog, and of course, you know, I jump in. Um, <laughs> no, but um, I think that's a great point. Um, when I am working with someone, I think the fear ultimately is I'm still having high blood sugars and I'm offering medicines, right? 
um, like this doesn't make sense. And sometimes that's what I have to encourage. Like when I'm looking at a diet and I'm, they're telling me, you know, I'm trying to watch the carbs, I'm watching what I'm doing. Um, I, I look at the carbohydrate amount and if it's appropriate, but we're still having 250s five hours later, um, just like they're saying, it, it's not a matter of the, the medication. It, sometimes it's just a matter of, are you producing enough insulin? Yeah. Am I right? Um, so that's when definitely the physician needs to be involved. It's not a, hey, you can't, you can't not eat for all day long because you're not good. That's not solving the issue, right? Okay. So um, the food books are definitely helpful because then I can really say, like, sure, that's definitely potentially still um, a food issue. And if it's not, that's a definite red flag that our medications be adjusted. They're not the right type for what's going on with you. And I'm going to add, too, that this is why it's important to know your health information and know your business. If you do not see your goals being met in a reasonable amount of time, and reasonable could be different if we ask, I don't know, the doctors here, but usually three months when you're doing a new treatment plan to six months, you should see results. If there's no results there, you need to come back to the drawing table and see, ooh, what else do we need to do or what do I need to adjust? So having a team and also a very open conversation with your primary care doctor is very important. Um, I'll add one thing um, from the pediatric standpoint, and I think this applies to adults too, although you guys will have to tell me, but your body can make sugar itself even without eating, right? Because your liver stores sugar. Correct. Yeah. That's what I was saying, like in the morning, you'll wake up with high blood sugar because your liver is still making sugar, right? glucose. And you know, you're, if you're under stress, your cortisol level increases, your growth hormone level increases. That increases also like the formation of glucose. So it's not like one right answer. There's multiple factors to look at at that point. Yeah. Great question. And I'm gonna put Ryan here on the spot. Uh, pharmacists, are there other medications that maybe cause blood sugars to go up? Because we take medicine for a lot of things, not just for diabetes, right? Yes. Um, so there's certainly plenty of medications that can cause your blood sugars to go up. Most notorious are going to be steroids. Um, hopefully these are more short-term medications than long-term. However, there are certain uh, patients who do need steroids long-term as well. And so it's just also kind of probably one of the most common themes, talk with your doctor. Um, and healthcare providers, if you are going to be started on steroids, don't just assume that all your doctors know that another one prescribed something. And so if you see your primary care doctor and they give you steroids for that cough that you've had for the past two weeks, then maybe also let your endocrinologist know that, hey, I'm going to be on these steroids for the next six days. Is there anything that I need to do from a monitoring standpoint? Um, so really, the steroids are probably the biggest one from a blood sugar perspective. Um, I don't know if any others come to mind um, from the panel, though. So also antidepressant medications can at times. Um, so again, really talking to your doctors as you're starting new medications to try to limit um, those side effects from happening. And I always say, talk to your pharmacist. Talk to your pharmacist, because the pharmacists know the most about the meds. And so they could be a great team player uh, to have if you're taking multiple medications. Good. Who else has a question? Yes. So the question is, what is the relationship between body weight and blood sugar? Who would like that one? <laughs> well, Emily, why don't you start from a dietary standpoint? Okay. It'll, it's um, so what we often educate on um, is just how well is insulin working in the body. So we find that with an increased um, fat mass, so if someone has recently Weight, um, and we have more fat cells present, um, insulin is not um, adhering as well or working as efficiently with excess fat cells um, is a, a general way to, to describe some of the effects. Um, uh, but it's a very weight in general, a very complicated um, kind of condition, you know, pro-inflammatory, we see differences in hormones um, with just higher weights. Um, so that can also influence insulin as well. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Or? <laughs> I mean, no, you said it right. So that's what we call like insulin resistance. Your body is not using the insulin appropriately when you have a lot of body fat um, that's around the organs. 
I call it the apple-shaped body. So you know how we get older, you get wider around the belly. And so we see that's why weight is a correlation with not just diabetes, but other metabolic disorders. Um, and then we'll just kind of tack on with that. I was speaking with um, one of the individuals today about pre-diabetes. Um, so often we see lots of people for um, you know, uh, internal medicine is concerned. They have a, a strong heart, um, high risk for heart disease. Now their blood sugars are creeping up there and they've been told they have pre-diabetes. They come into the office and they're like, how many carbs do I need? And I'm like, well, um, I'm gonna surprise you a little bit, but we're actually just gonna focus a little bit on some weight management. Um, so we, we really target the weight somewhat in, in those type of situations um, to get that insulin to work more efficiently. And we see the blood sugars respond really well. Um, so really initially too, some of the earlier stages, um, weight loss is really, and you know, well, we can do that by focusing on some carbohydrates, but um, really we, we try to reduce the weight. So. Dr. Nate, could you speak a little bit about insulin resistance in younger people and the family correlation? So one thing we do see just from seeing families, and this is why I encourage families that come to me to bring the whole family to me, is it, food is tied to from culture to, to everything, part of your life. So when the kids come in and if they have a weight problem, I try not to address it where I point out their weight, especially in our young female patients because that, there's a lot more that goes into that. So I focus on a healthy lifestyle for the whole family. And so sometimes the parents don't know what they're eating is causing problems at home that sets their children up for these health diseases. They just say we have diabetes in the family, but they don't realize the things that the family has been eating for generations sets them up for this. And so for me, weight does matter for certain things, but I try not to make it where I point it out, but I find a lot of patients um, feel very victimized for this and they won't come for help. And so we focus on whole wellness and lifestyle management so that way with the kids, they respond better because they're young, they don't understand if someone tells them there's a weight problem, they think I'm fat and it's closed down and they're not gonna listen. But if you say, oh, we have to be healthy, we have to eat properly so you can get strong and you can grow well, and then everybody listens and then we can try to stop that generational problem and try to stop the diabetes that's hereditary because of all these generational food things that have been happening. So that's how we approach it. Very good. Um, yes, I, I see here, here, I'm sure families, I would like to bring family and bringing children. Uh, so if you're already past that age, your grandchildren and everybody that's around you is part of this conversation. Hmm? Point. Sure. Is there any research for people that are insulin dependent now? Uh, any studies on any restoration of function of the pancreas? The question is if you're insulin dependent, is there any evidence or research regarding restoration of organ function, like better cell function in the pancreas specifically? So, I mean, there have been some research about how can we restore the better cell function of the pancreas. Right now, um, the only way to be able to restore that is by doing a pancreatic transplantation. But this is actually reserved at this point to patients who have um, chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease and they're requiring a renal transplantation and they're type 1 diabetic, so at that time they will do a simultaneous um, kidney and pancreatic transplantation. Um, it's like something that people have been, you know, looking into it, or researchers are looking into it to see how we can restore the beta cell function. And it all depends if it's like a type one or type two, because we know for type one, there's really no cure except for getting a new pancreas or getting your pancreas to work. And I'll, I'll, oops, I'll say one thing. For type twos, if you are new type two and you've been put on insulin because your A1C is 12 or 13, doesn't mean you lose all hope. There's still a chance if you're a new one and you're type two, not type one like Dr. Alhaik mentioned, but if you're type two and you work closely with your dietitian and with your endocrinologist to lose the weight, that does sometimes get you out of those ranges. I, I've had several patients who've been 12 or 13 and with really hard dedication, they've come down to six within three months, sometimes even six months. So it is possible when you're early, but if you've been that way for like five, six years, by then the pancreas has kind of given up. So we gotta 
catch it when it's early and give that pancreas a chance to actually respond well. But if you think about it, it's like a pump, right? If you have a small pump for like a big house, it's not gonna work well and it'll break down eventually. So you gotta kind of give it what it can work with. And everybody's gonna be a different size for that. Very nice. So the question is, if you have type 2 diabetes and a high triglycerides and the risk of pancreatitis, is that the question? Does that, do, do they come together? And do you treat them all the same way? Is there a blanket treatment, or is it each thing that you tell them? Should it be treated all the same, or individual treatment for each one of the problems? Who wants that one? <laughs> 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 So if you had a history of pancreatitis due to elevated triglycerides, I mean, obviously the elevated, elevated blood sugar will drive your triglycerides to go higher. So we need like a better control of the blood, of the blood glucose levels, weight loss. And then, um, so other than following a low carb diet and following also a low uh, fat diet and um, to, to bring down like your blood sugars and your triglycerides. So, and you notice like once the blood sugars start going down, your triglyceride levels will also start going down. Um, now in terms for the treatment of the diabetes, having a history of pancreatitis will prevent us from using some medications that might increase your risk of pancreatitis. So we cannot use um, some groups of medication like DPP-4 inhibitors or GLP-1s, uh, which are really good drugs for diabetes that help with the weight loss and help with blood sugar control. So it makes it a little bit um, trickier to treat. Um, some people with pancreatitis, they, they need to be on insulin if their blood sugars are really high and we cannot get them under control just like with the diet and the oral medications. Um, way in the back. I'll try to speak up. Um, I was at Target a couple of days ago, and I saw this thing, I think it's called Sugar Break. It was on the, it was in the diabetes area. It's a saliva test that gives, huh. like, supposedly, the online reviews are not good, but supposedly would give, like, you a color depending on the range of your blood glucose at that moment. Um, I just wondered if, because I've never heard of this, so it's a way to monitor your blood sugar by saliva. Yeah, and it's $10 a target. I wonder if you all know anything about this. Do any of you know anything about this new product? Um, I'm seeing everybody. <laughs> you stumped us. I, mean, this, <laughs> I, I, will say, I will say one thing. If you are curious about it, it would be fine to bring it to your doctor's office and have them do a blood sugar and test it in office no, to see how accurate it is. Yes, always a word of caution. I actually took a picture of that product and sent it to my coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do find the, um, you know, I, I like to see what's in, there are diabetes sections in Target and Walgreens and Walmart, and that's often where I'll have the conversation of glucose tablets, um, ketone testing strips. Um, they make a lot of great um, travel kits now, so. I'm over there perusing it. Yes, I saw that, and then this company also makes another very off-marketed program of, um, of something that you can take to eliminate sugar cravings. Right away, I've got some red flags with those kind of products, um, so I can't speak to the reliability of that, but yes, I always do some comparison, so if you were to even test out that, compare it to a CBM, but um, using it long term, I definitely want to clarify, but um, I honestly have no idea about the reliability, but they did some other questionable products that I wasn't 100% sure what they were using. I think they're using some herbal remedies for the sugar that actually just numb the tongue. So, um, yes, but um, we will all be getting it. Well, <laughs> while we're in that section, what about uh, food products that are targeted for people that live with diabetes? Sure. Um, most of this section is more in the pharmacy, so um, th there wasn't a ton of necessarily food targeted or food products, but do you have something in mind? Well, I'm just thinking like diabetic cookies, diabetic candies, diabetic, ah, diabetic, any food product that yes. targeted. Yes, we're seeing less terms of um, diabetic, but we're seeing a lot of uh, keto terms, right? Um, Mission Tortilla has a new keto tortilla. Um, I've got lots of keto bread products. 
Um, so you'll see that marketed, and I think um, people with diabetes are kind of driven in, in that direction now. Um, Sugar-free does not mean carbohydrate-free. That's the first and biggest lesson that we can talk about. Um, when it comes to, that's a big part of your education with a dietitian is really teaching you the terms carbohydrate, starch, sugar, um, so that you feel very confident in the relationship it, of it all. Um, so you gotta be careful in the marketing. I will say the easiest just to make this answer short, um, look over the product look at the nutrition label and read the total carbohydrate. That big, bold number is gonna drive, be the ultimate driver in blood sugar response. And that's what you want. I don't care if it's a 26 seed sprouted alfalfa on the side of the mountain bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, we wanna look at the total carbohydrate. Um, and then the dietitian or the diabetes educator would give you some other good points to kind of help round out that product, but um, don't fall for marketing. Don't fall for sugar-free, keto, blah, blah, blah. Um, look at the total carbohydrate and just be safe. And try to choose real food. <laughs> and then I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, no sir. question? Yep. Oh. Are sweet potatoes good for you or not? Brian. <laughs> 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 goals are. That's my first question if someone asks me about a product, right? If, if your answer, if your question is, is this good for blood sugar control, um, my answer would be yes, it will make your blood sugars go up. It is a starch. Does it provide you good nutrition? Absolutely. Um, so I kind of give the analogy of you, you get a, um, a paycheck, right? Every two weeks or however much you get it. You have to pay certain bills. You have to take care of certain requirements, right, with your money. Um, I, I use the same thing with carbohydrates. So um, certain people can handle certain volumes of carbohydrates, but I wanna make sure we're hitting all the nutritional needs that you have. So um, sweet potatoes compared to white potatoes, russet potatoes, very similar carbohydrate content, um, but slightly different nutrients, a little bit high, Vitamin A, fiber content can be a little bit different. Um, so it kind of depends what you're going for in terms of blood sugars. It'll raise you just like a, a regular potato would. Do I think it could fit in your diet plan? Absolutely. So I had a conversation with someone else about a potato too. So great potassium content. <laughs> yes, right over here. I'm a type one, a type two diabetic whose blood sugar is tightly controlled. I also have heart risk issues. My question is, is uh, are any of the new uh, medications, the SGLT2s, uh, RIP ones, uh, are they recommended, as, in my case, to get enhanced uh, lower risk heart issues? So if I have type 2 diabetes, very tightly controlled by other, other risk factors, could I benefit from the newer version of medications, like the GLP-2? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is why there's no one size fits all. When we look at the treatment for a patient, we look at their comorbidities. You know, are we looking at also having them lose weight? Do they have like any cardiovascular uh, problems, like any history of congestive heart failure? And uh, a lot of times, um, so those, the medications like SCLT2 inhibitors like Jardians and Farsiga come into that play, or even like GLP-1s, like once weekly injectables. Um, even they have been used for patients who don't have diabetes, who just have like congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease. We see them, the cardiologists use a lot of the Farsigas and Jardians on those patients. So yes, even if your diabetes is under good control, and your treatment plan does not include those medications, sometimes we take away one of your medications that you're on to add those medications that will have both a benefit on your diabetes and on your um, cardiovascular well-being. Great question. Somebody in that end had a question? No? Oh, OK. Yeah, oh, there you go. They got in the orange. <laughs> yeah.
yoga. You know, why would there be such a huge impact out of uh, something that's lo- not aerobic, etc., of yoga? What, what would you think about yoga? Mm-hmm. 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 M
can I change medicine, that kind of thing. Um, it's actually not a consensus at all that, that very low carbohydrate works for the very general population. So it may with some individuals, sure, and that, that may be a great plan for them, but long term we see a lot of problems with sticking to that low carb, just being really realistic about it. So living off a banana a day for me is really hard. Yes. How do the once a week injections work for in the body on the day by day? So the weekly injectables, um, they increase certain hormones or certain enzymes that we call incretins. The incretins are chemicals that are usually released by the guts in response to food. So, and they have like an essential role in lowering the blood sugars. They can delay the gastric emptying, so kind of like make you feel full faster, so they, you don't eat as, you know, people don't have a tendency to overeat. They also like increase the insulin secretion by the pancreas, and they help with increasing the insulin sensitivity, so decreasing the insulin resistance. And so this is how they work in terms of lowering the blood sugars and also helping with the weight loss. Yes, go ahead. Can you tell us that when you have high blood pressure, you know, all these symptoms of dizziness and tiredness and thirst and all that, but how does a high blood uh, sugar content affect the blood vessel? When blood sugars are high, we experience several symptoms, but how does it affect the blood vessels? Yeah. So I think we'll both go. I'll start with a simpler answer, and then she'll give you a very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, both will be nice. <laughs> but, um, so typically, we find that um, with having high blood sugars, oftentimes what goes hand in hand with that is high cholesterol. So we know that the cholesterol can lay plaques down in the arteries. So we cause damage that way to the arteries by the the plaques that get laid down into the arteries. The other thing is the higher sugars kind of make the blood a little stickier. So as it goes through the blood vessels you have these sticky blood cells going through to kind of pull and tear at the mucosa of the blood vessels, so they're not as strong as they used to be. So the blood doesn't flow as easily, and it doesn't get to places. So when you see somebody with really bad blood sugars, and you hear about checking their feet, and sometimes they'll get the black feet because the blood isn't flowing that well, it's because of the damage that's done over years of these sticky blood cells and the cholesterol plaques not getting the blood to where it needs to go. And so, those portions of the body die off because they're not getting blood. The body learns to conserve the blood to the most important organs, which are all here in your body. But your legs, they don't care about. Sure, you need them to walk, but your body's going to conserve the blood to the heart and to the organs. So if your blood vessels are not working well to get the blood where it needs to go, the body's not going to pump harder to get it there. It's going to try to conserve it to get it to the organs first. Was that, that was an adequate answer? Yeah, that's a very adequate oh. answer. Oh. Yeah, and I'm going to add to that, though, so the vascular system carries oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood everywhere, and it picks up dirty blood, right, uh, to, so your body can cleanse itself. So if this vascular system, I like to think of it as the pipes in your house, if some of those pipes are clogged, are not properly letting the flow go, that's what eventually lacks nutrients or oxygen to those tissues. So that's why we have complications that affect your sight, that affect your brain, that affect your heart, your kidneys, and your extremities. Wherever gl blood goes, if it's too much blood sugar, it's going to irritate it and hurt it. And vascular disease is where we see it most prominently. Any questions from uh, the panel? For, yeah, yeah, go ahead.
So the question is regarding a food label on a granola bar. Uh, we have 26 grams of total carbs, and then there's a breakdown between fiber, uh, sugar, and then added sugar, which does not add up to that total number. So, great question. Um, one of my first basic educations, like I said, understanding these terms. Um, so think of carbohydrate as um, an umbrella term. Um, when it comes to your food, um, if you've heard of these people counting macronutrients or, or large structures, food itself starts out very large structurally. The whole role of your um, GI system, so your stomach, um, the intestines, is to break down the large structures into very tiny structures, right? So your body can use those tiny pieces as energy. Um, for simple terms, in order to be considered a carbohydrate, ultimately I have to um, break down that food and release glucose into the bloodstream. That's how I consider if a food is a, a carbohydrate or not. So will this break down into glucose? Yes. Um, Glucose is also made for sugar, your blood sugar is what you're pricking your finger for. Um, the problem is there's different ways to arrange glucose. So um, carbohydrate, the umbrella term, I can arrange glucose in um, the form of a starch, or I can arrange glucose in the form of um, a more complex sugar. What's the difference between those? Sure, just the way that they're strung together. So starch, if you, if you visibly look at starch, it's just very long chains of glucose, very simply strung together. So um, often I get a bad reputation too, right? Um, potatoes, very starchy, bread, very starchy, pasta. Um, it gets a bad reputation because all your GI system has to do is break these little bonds that string all those together, and then what are you left with? Glucose, 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 right? Um, sugars are a little bit more complex. Um, they may be paired with other sugars, but glucose being one of them. There are foods that naturally have sugar in them, fruit and milk products. So um, we know glucose and in an OSC, right? We also know there's lactose and we know there's fructose. So those are the natural occurring sugars in those products. Then we also just have kind of um, added sugars. So um, table sugar, white cane sugar, brown sugar, agave, nectar, honey. Um, so I've got carbohydrates, I could arrange them in a starch, I could arrange them in um, sugars, whether that's a, a simple added sugar or um, a fruit or milk. So when you look at that product, um, you have total carbohydrate in bold, right? And everything's indented, meaning everything under that is included in the total carbohydrate. The thing that is not required to be specifically laid out is the starch. So I get the example often of um, a bagel. If I looked at the total carbohydrate number in that product, it may be 52 grams of carb. If I looked at the sugar in terms of, does it have any fruit or any milk? Probably not, right? To make a bagel, it's flour and water. Um, I don't really have a lot of added sugar either, right? And maybe two, that product is primarily starch, flour, and that's not specifically listed there. So that's what you're missing in that product. That granola bar, there's oats in it, right? So um, that oats, that starch content, is also contributing to that total number. So you just see them kind of break it down in a product like that, and I'm like, you don't need to know that crazy amount of how you arrange glucose and things like that. I think just knowing that the total carbohydrate includes starch content, natural sugars, added sugar. Um, and fiber um, doesn't really influence blood sugars, um, but that would be included in that number as well. Does that help clear it up a little bit? It's the starch. Blame it on the starch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I also see the word sugar alcohol. What is that? What is a sugar alcohol? Um, I can turn this off. Um, a sugar alcohol is just um, another form of an artificial sweetener. Um, so technically, you'll see these a lot, um, especially in these new keto products. Um, the sugar alcohols are, are often used, um, and they will they will subtract that from the total carbohydrate, and then mark it itself as one gram net carb. Um, you do not absorb sugar alcohols, um, so they technically don't influence the blood sugars as as much as regular sugar does. Um, I just caution. Um, the GI side effects of a um, sugar alcohol, they can cause a little bit of um, stomach upset, 
diarrhea. Um, they're often used in like protein powders, um, drinks. Um, you'll see um, erythritol. Um, that's a, a common sugar alcohol. So they, they just list it because they typically can subtract it from the total carb to give you a lower number, but I kind of don't recommend doing that. So it shouldn't be too much. <laughs> yes. So how does glycemic index affect blood sugar? Let's still talk about food now, huh? <laughs> yeah, we're going to the start. Um, I'm curious to see um, also what, what the physician's thought on that is. Um, so glycemic index is um, uh, a measurement of a blood sugar response based on a certain volume of food. So we score, we score foods. Um, if I had a certain volume of any food product, what's the blood sugar response? Um, so a common recommendation is to, to focus foods um, that don't have high glycemic index numbers. So by meaning I could eat a large number, of, large volume of this product with little influence on the blood sugars. Um, for some people, it's a really helpful tool. Um, unfortunately, some products such as carrots um, get a high glycemic index, and then I have a patient coming in saying I can't eat carrots, um, which I would hate um, to see them avoid carrots. Um, it's based on volume. So think of how heavy a carrot is um, and how much carrot I would have to, to consume to get that blood sugar response. I think it is a general helpful tool. You know, you see that potatoes have a higher glycemic index. They're going to raise your blood sugars pretty quickly. Um, I use it more so in some conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. It's a, a hormonal condition with females. Um, I, I hit on it sometimes, um, but I think there's other tools we could use that would be a little bit more of impactful. And I'm going to add to that. Sometimes the way I like to think about it is, you know, drinking a glass of orange juice or eating four or five oranges. So if you drink a glass of orange juice, you go gloop, gloop. In 10 seconds, the glycemic effect of that product in your body is going to be very high because there's no digestion that needs to happen right? If you sit down and cut and chew four oranges, now the mechanical and the involvement that is going to be present on that experience, it's going to be the same amount of sugar at the end of the day, but it's a totally different pathway. So the orange juice will be a higher glycemic food versus eating a piece of fruit, which would be a lower glycemic way to do it. Does that make sense? So there's different approaches. So eating real food is always the way to go. Any questions? Can I do one time? Um, Gloris, we have a question from the booth here. Okay. Is it important for metformin users to monitor their B12 levels? So metformin. <laughs> so metformin is associated with B12 deficiency. So I do monitor B12 for my patients at least once a year, especially if they have like peripheral neuropathy. Um, so one of the B12 deficiency can exacerbate that neuropathy. And, um, and so it's important to make sure that they are on B12 supplementation. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes, a question at the back. So the participant has a question regarding a friend that started some of these newer medications and it has taken her appetite completely out of the equation. So she's not hungry. How is that? Mm -hmm. She's losing weight, but is she healthier? So if you're a person with diabetes, it's best to eat a couple times a day to regulate your blood sugars. Now your friend is taking this medication and she's not eating at all. So how does this happen? Or not eating much. Or much. So 
So, as you said, one of the known side effects of the Ozempic or the, or the GLP-1s, like the injectables, is making you not hungry as much or feeling full or having a decreased appetite or nauseous. So the effect of the medication kind of like wears off the longer you've been on the medication. Right, so, so you know, after, after a month or two, the side effects will slow down. And we do see like the weight loss with those medications, especially initially after starting the treatment. But after like three, four months being on the treatment, it's gonna level out, it's gonna plateau. So some of the side effects will go away. If they are, if, if she's having like vomiting or she's having like severe abdominal cramps or um, she's having, Right, so then, then we need to change the medication and try something different. But again, not all medications are right for each person. She needs to lose the weight, and so those are probably the best medications for her to start on. If, she has, if, if this is like bothering her quality of life, she's not able to eat all the time, she's nauseous all the time, she's not able to um, you know, do her job because of the nausea and the side effects, then it will be the time to maybe think about switching medications. If she's not having, so she needs to monitor her blood sugar, making sure that she's not getting hypoglycemic, try to still continue to eat smaller meals. So she will, instead of like eating a full meal, which she's not gonna have any appetite for, eating like smaller meals, but regular, regular meals. I'll hop in since we're talking about medications. Uh, um, and so this really highlights, not just for your friend, but for everybody that if you're starting new medication or if you're on medications and you notice that something's off, something's different, make sure to talk to the provider about it because they could possibly decrease the dose for starting because we do that a lot in terms of you know patients, metformin for example. So a lot of people probably started on only 500 milligrams once a day when really treatment dose is like, what, 2,000? 2,000 a day? So you know, 500 to 2,000, the reason we do that is because of the GI side effects. And so, you know, being comfortable with talking with your providers that, hey, I'm noticing these side effects and, you know, working with, they'll work with you to try something that works. Um, Cause it's more important that you're taking the medication than, you know, being miserable as well, or just self stopping the medication and they think you're on it and really you haven't been. Oh, you took the words out of my mouth because that's one a common, um, I think I've, I've encountered as a diabetes educator. Uh, oftentimes, and in the general public, people begin a medication and may not feel right and they stop taking it, but they don't necessarily communicate that to their healthcare provider and then goals are not being met. How often does that happen, um, Ryan, or do you see it? So there actually have been a couple studies that look at you know, patient compliance with medications as well as medication errors. And they actually found that in patients experiencing side effects up to 70% of the time, they're actually pretty accurate in terms of being able to attribute it to the correct medication. So take some pride in knowing that if something's wrong with you, take comfort that like, you know your body the best out of anybody else. And so if something's off, something doesn't feel right, have that conversation because three fourths of the time, you're probably correct, at least in some capacity. And so whether that's changing medications, changing dosing, changing when you take the medicine, time of day, all could be potential um, fixes to that as well. I'll just jump in with that really quickly um, because we're seeing a lot of the injectable non-insulin medications lately and um, us working with someone uh, as a dietitian and diabetes educator, um, you know, at first you're concerned, right? Because if I'm not eating, I also need to make sure that nutritional needs are being met, right? If they're able to go almost all day without eating now because this medication is really slowing things down and they're not getting that I'm hunger or I'm hungry kind of sensation, um, nutritionally, I'm not so much worried about the calories as I am like quality content. Like if their protein intake has now dropped down to 10 grams a day because they're eating one meal a day, that's where I'm worried in terms of like long-term muscle breakdown and things like that. Um, if someone is on multiple medications and their blood sugars are significantly elevated, I mean, we're concerned about the long-term side effects. We are. Okay, so 
and it may be warranted because these medications are just, um, they're very impressive when it comes to weight loss and you can see why of what she's experiencing. Um, but also other risk factors. You know, we know there's been some big research studies that are very cardiovascular protective. And if you've learned one thing today, it's diabetes and heart disease and um, cardiovascular conditions. You cannot talk about diabetes without talking about cardiovascular complications. Um, so, I mean, weight, weight's a huge factor and those medications may be on there for very specific reasons for strong family history, you know, that kind of thing. But just nutritionally, I would want someone like that to just um, try to work with a dietitian or a diabetes educator and just make sure that like base needs are being met. It's maybe not even a factor of calories anymore um, and how much weight she's losing, but like that we can still meet our nutritional needs. So that's my just nutrition plug. And the other thing I'm gonna <laughs> add that too, if someone loses weight uh, and they're trying to, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, now, if you're losing weight, you may need to also talk back to your doctor because maybe other medications are weight-based and may need to be readjusted, okay? In any time in your life, if you're losing weight and you're not really trying to, that's always a sign of concern to talk to somebody. And with diabetes, when blood sugars are very, very high for a long time, Sometimes you've been told, oh, lose weight, lose weight, and all of a sudden you drop 20 pounds in just a few weeks and feeling good about it. That's a sign that something's not okay. So reaching out to your healthcare team uh, when anything is off uh, is always wise. And we're gonna go ahead and take one more question or two. Do we have any more from the, uh, from the virtual joining or from, yep, here in the front? If you are taking a statin, should you supplement with a Q10? Yeah. Pharmacist? <laughs> <laughs> um, really, the data with just about every dietary supplement that's out there, so anything that's in the vitamin and mineral section, there's really not much of anything in terms of real benefit for really any health. Um, the issue with these things, kind of going back to shopping in the Target uh, pharmacy aisle, is that these medications are never actually tested in clinical studies, and yet they still get approved. And so it's basically, it's manufactured in hopefully a clean way, but in terms of any sort of FDA approval, studies, rigorous studies, you know, for diabetes, we're talking thousands and thousands of patients. For heart disease, we're talking tens of thousands of patients. It's really not studied. Um, anecdotally, it might help. And there may be, there may be a couple studies that show benefit, but I could also probably find you 20 others that show it doesn't. And so if it works for them, maybe, is it gonna cause them harm? Probably not, but should you go ahead and start it just because you're on a statin, I would, I would say no. And you should always disclose if you're taking nutritional supplements to your primary care or your physician or your pharmacist, because they can interact with other medications. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, that was a good run. What do you think, docs and uh, panelists? We're gonna a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, and I can hear that there's a lot of questions in your brains, and I hope that you will process all that you learned today in the days to come. And I'm happy to announce that, well, even COVID's still in town. Uh, we will be bringing more uh, programs in person as well as virtually. And with that note, today we were offering some flu vaccines, uh, they vaccinated. Ryan, are vaccines just for people with diabetes or for everybody? Why are people with diabetes more important to be vaccinated? Uh, so vaccines are important for everyone, not just those with diabetes. However, it is particularly of importance for patients with diabetes because your immune system is considered weaker with, uh, with having diabetes. Um, it has been shown that, especially for like influenza, patients are at higher risk for hospitalization as well as going to the ICU if they have diabetes. However, the good thing is if you are vaccinated for the flu, that does decrease your risk. Now, I understand there is some concerns. You know, I got the flu shot and I still did get the flu. There is still data that shows that even if you still get the flu despite getting your flu shot, it still decreases, again, your risk for hospitalization or progressing to the ICU as well as dying. So important to get every year.
for yourself and for those around you, right? Very good. So we're going to announce uh, some of the winners. We have some really good prices, but before we do so, I want to thank uh, all the vendors, our internal and external vendors that came to support and the whole entire team that was able to put this together for us today. Um, we're going to go ahead and announce some of these gifts. So the first gift is going to be for one of our online presents because it's the only virtual gift that I have and it's a green bean uh, meal delivery, food delivery service and it's going to go for William Franklin. William, I hope you enjoy it. It's wonderful food. Uh, our next gift, Don, pull something up so that I can announce what it is. Okay, well, St. Luke's Therapy Services and Fitness Center has donated a 60-minute personal trainer session. And the winner is Diane Williams. Yay, <laughs> Diane! So if you haven't exercised in a long time, or if you have arthritis, or you're just not very confident, uh, St. Luke's Fitness Center is beautiful. You have walk-in valet parking and it's a very safe environment so either with a personal trainer an exercise physiologist with a physician with a referral for pt you can kind of get evaluated and come and start exercising in a safe environment so that you can gain strength and confidence you can check your blood sugar your blood pressure or if you're feeling fainty somebody can come and assist you so i hope to see you at the fitness center <laughs> okay our next gift from is Medtronic. for Medtronic. Uh, we have an Amazon gift card and it is for Patricia O'Neill. Is Patricia here? I'll change my name. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> Patricia O'Neill is not here and we're going to go to the next one, which is Peg. Peg Sharp. Okay, Peg, you go. Christmas is coming. That's a wonderful gift right there. Okay, this one is really special. And it's that autographed helmet. So do we have any football fans here? Because I am not, but I hear this guy is like a really famous football player for the Baltimore Ravens. And his name is Mark Andrews. So we have an autographed helmet. Uh, donated by Tandem uh, Pharmaceuticals, and this goes for Steve Huddleston. All right, Steve, there we go. I bet the resale price of that is pretty hefty, huh? <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Macy's Cosmetic Box, donated by Macy's Cosmetics, and it goes to Rosemary Schlanger. Yay, Rosemary! Okay, we also have a um, a well a St. Luke's wellness kit to go. Okay, so it's a wonderful cooler and a lunch box with silverware. It's reusable, environmentally friendly, and this one goes to Sherry Borland. Sherry, yay! And I believe we have one more gift, right? Do we? No. I think that's it? Yeah. Well, that's, I wanted to give you more gifts, okay? Uh, well, once again, I want to thank you for choosing to spend this time with us. We hope it was worth your time. Uh, we will, I will connect with you via email tomorrow, sending you an evaluation form that I hope you take a moment to complete. Uh, we do this for what we call community benefit. We do this for the goodness of our community, and we do our best. So thank you for being here and for providing feedback, and I hope to see you around. Okay, take good care of yourself and embrace wellness as a part of self-care. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists as well for coming out tonight.